Be kind to me. Um, Pastor Jeff thought it would be a good idea for me to open the floor and see if you have any questions. Um, so, um, any questions? Yes, sir. I have one. Uh, your Bible must have two translations. Hmm. There's another translation in there. Actually, it's just one translation, and it's the New American Standard Bible, okay. so NASB. Okay. When I was at, at Southern taking Greek and Hebrew, I remember the professor said that the NAB was the closest, or NASB, rather, was the closest translation from the Greek and the Hebrew to English. So um, that's what I started using back then, but I've, anyway, that's what I use. Some, yeah. Some read differently, and some read just like my Bible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. This was actually a gift from my wife um, um, when I was ordained in the Gold States, ordained to the gospel ministry in the Gold States Conference. This was my ordination gift from my bride. Amen. Yeah. Okay. I like those questions. Any easier or easy, easy questions? Yes, ma'am. My question, my question is like an observation. Maybe you can enlighten me on it a little bit. I noticed that um, people have a problem understanding forgiveness. Hmm. Let's say that um, you hurt someone or some, someone hurts you. Right. You go to that person and you say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I regret what, I, you know, what I've done. Right. And then it seems as if instead of Sometimes the situation, whatever the problem remains between the two of us, the person that you think has forgiven you will go and report this to somebody else and someone else and somebody else. So I don't know whether it is it an obs because sometimes I see Christian doing it too. Right. You know, it's like they're in the church, but yet, you know, something between the two of you happens and yet it never stays there. See, right. To me, the way I understand forgiveness, if somebody does something to me, I will go to that person and I'll say, you know, I don't like what you do to me. But it stays there. I don't go and spread it around. Right. You know, so can you just clarify sure. me on that? Um, yeah, my understanding of, if, of forgiveness, and, and I actually read it, and I'm trying to remember where I read it. Um, I think the name of the book is The Heart of Forgiveness. But the author of that book says that forgiveness is a promise. And it's actually three promises. When you, when you forgive, you're promising that you're not going to bring it up again to yourself. So when you forgive someone, you're not rehearsing it internally, you know, your thought life. Um, so you, you, you promise that you're not going to bring it up to yourself. The second promise is you're not going to bring it up to the individual that, that you have forgiven. So you won't go back three years from now and say, but you remember, you remember back then, so if you say, I forgive you, which you are mandated to do from Scripture if, you know, if you're asked, so that's what you're promising. I'm not going to bring it up myself uh, internally. I'm not going to bring it up to the, the individual. And I promise that I'm not going to bring up that incident, that issue with other people, or we would call that gossip. So that is forgiveness. Um, there's this thought, too, about forgiveness that... Um, I'm going to make a statement. Some people may find it um, kind of controversial because I've, seen, I've heard people say the opposite. Um, in my opinion, repentance is necessary for forgiveness. Now, Sister White talks about having a forgiving heart. So that's kind of extending an attitude of willingness to forgive is my understanding of having a forgiving heart would be. But, you know, God says, Jesus says, you know, forgive as you are forgiven. And how does God the Father forgive us? How does Jesus forgive us? Well, he forgives us when we repent our sins. So I would say that um, in order to forgive someone and make that promise, there needs to be some sort of repentance on their part. Now, others would say, well, what about, the, uh, what about Jesus on the cross? And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, Right? Well, obviously, the people, not all of the people that surrounded the foot of the cross were forgiven because we know that 
There are those who will be part of the special res resurrection when Jesus comes back who are going to be raised from the dead just so they can see Jesus coming. But they're lost people. Um, so not everyone received forgiveness. So I, my understanding is when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they do know not what they do. He had that forgiving spirit. He's offering his forgiveness for those who would be repentant. And I think of the, um, the Roman, the centurion, who said, surely this is the Son of God. Um, I believe we'll see him in heaven. He was repentant um, and he was forgiven. So anyway, just some thoughts on forgiveness. Anybody else? Okay. I believe, okay, one more thing. Okay. Um, I noticed that like in most environment at work, like church, um, sometimes I've heard even here, like the pastor saying to people, you know, you know you are, like people would go and always complaining, going to the pastor and complain about this, person, this thing or that thing or this person or that person. <laughs> My concern for those specific individuals, I want to know, do they feel that they are perfect, that they don't do anything wrong, huh. that they feel that they always have to go and report about someone? Huh. I mean, this is my concern because I feel we all have things in us that are not perfect mm -hmm. yet. We are still right. in the process. Right. And for someone, for me to always be going and, and, and always have some, something in their heart that is not right, that they always mm -hmm. feel someone is disturbing their environment. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, how do they feel themselves about themselves? Mm -hmm. Because I, when I go home, personally, I always feel something about me. Mm -hmm. I always feel there is something I need to change in me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I never like to go and report to the people because I know we're all in the process right. of growing spiritual, so we're here to help each other. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I wonder how can this be helped okay. for this specific individual that they know that, let me look at myself mm -hmm. instead of continuously looking at mm -hmm. this person here, or that person mm -hmm. is not doing right, or that person should be in that position, or, the, you know, I wonder how can this be changed mm -hmm. to create peace, because without us be looking at ourselves, we're going to create an environment of all the time, of issues. Right. You know, what you're describing is gossip. And as far as assigning a motive to the heart, I'm not sure I can do that. I, well, I know that I can't. It could be a number of reasons why people gossip, you know, what their motivation is. And none of us would know what that is because only the Lord knows the heart and what motivates us. Well, we can just assess behavior. But I would, I would just, I would turn that around and say, now, that type of situation, what to do about it, is spelled out very clearly in Matthew chapter 18. Um, you know, we typically deal with Matthew 18 in church discipline issues, um, but that's the, the, the culmination of the process of Matthew 18. The idea with Matthew 18 is that when you feel like you're sinned against, if someone is gossiping about you, then you, you deal with it by going to that person and talking to them. And... Um, you know, to confront your brother or sister in love is the way it's described. So you, go to, you don't go to them and grab them by the collar and shake them. Um, but you go to them and you say, hey, you know, when you're saying these things about me, whether they're true or not, it hurts. And it's sin. And it hurts me. And the reason for that is sometimes misunderstandings can happen. So we think something's going on that's not happening the way that we think it is. And it gives that person the opportunity when you follow the counsel of Matthew 18, Jesus' counsel, when you go to them and you say, when this happened, I was hurt, and gives them the opportunity to clarify and say, oh, I never meant it that way. I'm sorry. I will, I will address that. Or um, that's, that's the intended goal of the first step. That's what you pray would happen is that the person would be receptive to the counsel. And then if not, then the second and I, I would like to add a lot of times in Matthew 18, we think it's three and out. You know, it's, it's, 
We go one time, that's all it takes. A lot of times with Matthew 18, if someone's sinning against us, it requires us going to that person individually multiple times before we go to the next step. And the next step is to bring somebody with you, like one of the elders of the, the church. And again, you don't go and, and berate them or beat them up. You just present it and, you know, this is what, these are the facts. This is what's happened. This is, this is hurtful, it's sinful. And you give the person an opportunity to repent. If they, they don't, then it goes to the, the next step. So, you know, as far as determining motives, when you go to that person and confront them in love and say, hey, this is hurtful, you, know, you can ask questions and say, um, so what's going on? You know, why, uh, why are you doing this? And, and listen and, and find out what their motives are. But without that conversation, it's hard to know, you know what would be motivating them. Yes, sir. So uh, one of the things that I have, I know this weekend is supposed to be about discipleship, and I know that the Holy Spirit has led me in discipleship in several cases. And one of the things that I struggle with is, you know, we've become friends with people, and uh, after we've become friends with them, we've shared with them about God and everything. But I'm having a lot of trouble with patience. Uh, what kind of advice can you give to someone who has that? I mean, I, I try to think in terms of this is going to be a lifelong friendship with this person. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, when they're just not seeming to really give it over to, the, to God, you know, that's, where, that's when I lose patience a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a magic bullet for you. The, uh, the answer is prayer. And, and there are people who are more receptive to discipleship than others. So um, it's a lot of times when we're discipling, it's like fly fishing. Um, and you, you just, if you're familiar with fly fishing, it's different from regular fishing where you've got the bobber, you, you throw it out there and you just wait. Fly fishing, you, you cast the line, you wait and you see if there's a nibble. And then if you get a bite, you reel it in. And discipleship is a lot like that, too. When you're working with people, you, you cast it out there and you see if there's a, an interest. And if, um, if the interest wanes and they're not as interested, you still make yourself available to them. And you pray for, for their heart. You pray for interest to be piqued. And um, it's really a spiritual issue. So you can't force a spiritual issue with someone. Um, and then you pray for your own patience. And then recognize that the, it, the, the struggle with the person you're trying to disciple and their lack of interest may be being used by uh, God in your own patient's development, you know, the sanctification process. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I struggle with, too, is uh, the devil likes to use the tool that says, hey, you're not really good enough to be out there doing that. Right. And I try not to let him talk to me that way, but mm -hmm. sometimes he sneaks those thoughts into my mind. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Okay. I really appreciated the fact that you shared that you had an issue with uh, smoking. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, um, I perceive our world lives in an environment where we have issues with uh, temperance and folks of addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that the addiction of our, we have this addiction in our country to drugs really drives worldwide economics in a way and it drives all kinds of issues that uh, we see and we don't see. I'm curious what your thoughts are from a personal practical level and from a church level, what we could do in order to help people through their addictions. I just had a cousin who committed suicide because he was addicted to drugs ever since he was a teenager. And at the age of 26, he took his life. And there was a family structure. There, were, there was church not in it, but there was around, right? And somehow it just could never connect. And it seems to me like with, for example, the desire for the US to uh, make marijuana legal, they, we, we kind of gloss this as, a, as an issue of uh, recreation, right? And so 
my curiosity to you is how did you get through it? What is your uh, suggestion for the church as a whole, the Christian church as a whole, to reach out to people and really bring them around and, and, and make that change, you know, practical and, and impactful in their life? Yeah. Well, quitting smoking was easy. I did it a dozen times. <laughs> um, and you just, you just mentioned the, the drugs and alcohol and tobacco, but you can add pornography to that, um, which is addictive. By the way, brain scans show that people who view pornography have the same um, responses in the brain as when they're doing um, mainline drugs. Um, and that's the reason people, it's addictive. Um, it's that um, increase in the dopamine, going back to dopamine, there is an increase with that that has been demonstrated, it's proven. And the same, so it's the same with, with drugs and that, that feeling. Um, and it's the same way with caffeine, too. If you notice, um, you know, when, if, you, if you need a pick-me-up and you, and you drink a soda, you feel better. Um, your attitude, your mood feels better. But after a while, you feel like you did before and a little bit lower. And so what you do is you, you drink Coke or a soda or whatever more frequently. And it requires more and more in order to get that dopamine level up to where you're feeling good again. So it's a, that's part of the addiction process. Um, but as far as is what helped me was a decision on my part to be done. And um, anyone who has not reached that place with an addiction is not going to be delivered from it. Um, I also tried to do it on my, on my own a lot of times. And I think a reason why I tried to do it on my own is I only half-heartedly wanted to quit. The, the amazing thing about addictions, whatever the addiction is, is you want to quit when you're in the middle of doing it. Um, when you're taking the drugs or you've got a full pack of cigarettes and you got one in your hand, and that's when you want to quit. But when you're at the place where you don't have it and you have the cravings, you no longer want to quit. So in helping people who are struggling with addictions is they have to, they have to be at the place where um, when they no longer have the substance, they're still willing to go forward and still willing to go through and do it. Um, with cigarette smoking, it's different. There are practical things that you can do there, and the same with drugs. There are practical things that you can do. I, when I quit um, smoking, I was a, a big, my, my dad was a big coffee drinker. And when I was 10 years old, it was a rite of passage. I got a coffee. I got to drink coffee with my dad at 10. And that's what we did together. That's how we bonded. And then I went to nursing school I, while working full time and going to nursing school full time at night and would drink three pots of coffee a day. And I was a heavy smoker. And everyone kept saying, you know, the five-day plan, they said, when you quit smoking, you need to quit caffeine as well. Nicotine and caffeine, they, they sound similar because chemically they're similar. And so caffeine, that's why when you're a smoker, you always want a cup of coffee with a cigarette. They go good together, go well together. Um, so everyone, you know, the five-day plan says quit caffeine as you're quitting smoking. And my pastor said, this is what you've got to do. And I said, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> uh, quit the caffeine and the nicotine? And he said, do it. Well, I never did it. And I quit trying to quit, and I drank the coffee and, and, and didn't quit. But I did finally go off of caffeine, had the horrible migraines, and, and then once I got through that, then I started working on the, the cigarettes. And I did all the things that I thought at the time were, were silly about taking a shower with really cold water and, and using a washcloth to briskly rub your skin. All the things the five-day plan says to do, I thought they sounded really silly, but they helped. And, um, and another part of how I quit cigarettes was just a mental thing. I thought, um, it's been five minutes since I had a cigarette. I did it. I can go five more minutes. And so I, I would, the next time I had a craving for a cigarette, I'd look at my watch and say, wow, it's been 15 minutes. I made it 15 minutes. I can do this. And then there was a lot of prayer, too. Um, so, you know, it's a complicated subject. There's got to be a willingness on the part. There has to be accountability. Uh, you have to have someone who is lovingly intrusive in your life, who's asking prying questions, who's checking up on you, um, who is 
uh, making sure, you know, I'll go to, um, I, I just did a seminar on pornography not too long ago, so I'll use examples from that. Um, in seminary, when I was taught those, those two counseling classes that I mentioned, it was all behavior focused. And they said, if someone's struggling with pornography, move the computer to a public place and put a filter on the computer. Now, after all the time that we've spent together, you can tell that's only modifying behavior. What's in the person's heart that's drawing them to the, the pornography? So you want to do more than, than just put a filter on the computer. Um, but I would say that putting a filter on the computer, putting the computer in a public place, um, putting um, apps on the devices, um, that is important. I'm not minimizing that. In fact, I would say it's probably the first thing that you want to do. It's called uh, triage. You know, you want to... If you come up on an accident and someone's got a, a head injury and an arterial bleed, um, you want to take care of the arterial bleed first um, and then take care of the head injury. So what I would recommend with that topic on pornography is um, install something like Covenant Eyes on the computer and all of the devices. And Covenant Eyes, the way that it works is it's, it's not free. There's a monthly subscription. But... On my phone, I have it just for accountability. And um, the way that it works is it's not just a filter, but every week my accountability partner gets an email that shows him every, uh, well, he can set it up in different ways. If he wants, if he has that much time, he can go and look at every website that I have visited in that week period and it will highlight any websites that had questionable material. It'll be highlighted at the top of the report. Um, I think the report that he gets is that he gets an alarm if I have viewed anything that's inappropriate. And um, so he's my accountability partner. And my children don't have access to any computer that doesn't have that same kind of software on it. So it's important that um, you have accountability. Um, I've heard of people, uh, and, and by the way, with Covenant Eyes, um, there are no, there are some filters and, 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 I'm going to give the kid's secret away, but with most, most filters, you give a kid 30 minutes alone and they can get work around, around the filters. Um, Covenant Eyes is very secure. There are no workarounds. And so there, there's no way that you can, can beat the, the system when it's set up the way that you're instructed to set it up. So um, you can't remove it. Um, from your device or your computer without your accountability partner getting an an immediate response, immediate notification that you've removed it. So your accountability partner can pick up the phone and say, dude, what, what's going on? Um, so I would do that. And, and then I would suggest that, and this would work with any addiction, and that is that you ask a lot of questions to find out um, what the heart issues are that the person is, is dealing with. When is it that they're using drugs? When is it that they're smoking? When is it that they're viewing pornography? and find out what the, the common denominator is in all of those things. Um, is it boredom? Is it laziness? Uh, again, since I just did a seminar on, on pornography, uh, one of the most common reasons that people give is relational laziness. Um, to have a relationship with a member of the opposite sex, it is hard work. It takes dying to self. It takes um, sacrifice. It takes commitment. But what pornography provides is a bypass to all of that. The person has a, a sense, a feeling of affirmation from the person on the screen, this image, that um, they like me. They like me. They respect me. Um, I'm attractive to them. But I get those warm, fuzzy feelings without having to invest any work in the relationship. So it, it short circuits that. So I would want to know, I would want to dig deeper and find out what is it about relationships, what are they striving for, what is the idol of their, their heart. So, it's kind of a convoluted answer. But. Actually, it's very helpful. Okay. I think uh, statistically, for example, uh, the, uh, the use of tobacco has gone down. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that Philip Morris makes on tobacco is a lot less than the U.S. And, but we have other issues. We have a big heroin problem. Mm -hmm. We have bath salts issues. There's all these right. really off-the-counter drugs that uh, are fully available. They're really, really bad. 
And I think we've dropped the ball a little bit, right? I remember when I was growing up, we used to have a five-day stop smoking plan uh, in Los Angeles Hollywood Church probably once every two months, and it would be full. You know, people would come. We probably don't need that anymore statistically, but we do need maybe a heroin thing or yeah. something. You know, things that, this, things that people have to deal with, and I think your thoughts were actually quite helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, by the way, without beating the, the pornography thing to, to death, let me give you a statistic. Um, right now, the, um, the age of first exposure to pornography has dropped from 11 to 9. That's the average age of exposure. Um, for the 18 to 25 age group, 80% um, of individuals in that age group have viewed pornography. 80% of the 18 to 25-year-olds. Um, so it is, it is rampant and, and so easily accessible. And um, kids are able to, to, to find it everywhere. Um, so anyway, be parents. You know, that's my passion, families. So parents, be very, very, very cautious about um, computers. And by the way, social media sites, uh, I'm giving away all the secrets, but... Like Facebook, um, it seems to be safe um, because inappropriate pages are shut down pretty quickly by Facebook, usually within 24 hours. But Facebook is inundated with people setting up fake profiles, thousands and thousands and thousands every day, that as Facebook finds one, they shut it down, but there are others. Um, you know, I, I didn't understand that, and I was at Bass Academy, and... Um, the principal there, who's now at Fletcher, Phil Wilhelm, um, said, we don't, we don't allow the kids to, to use Facebook on the, the computers. It's blocked. And, and all the kids thought, man, they're so mean. It's so archaic. Well, you can find everything on Facebook. Everything. So. Okay, anyway. Yes, so, I wanted to kind of go into, as you've written been talking about the problems with addictions and all that. From our church perspective, as we try to reach out to people, people even within our church, people outside of our church, um, it's very difficult to know how to handle that, how to address that from the spirit of in, in discipleship, that you want to be the loving example of Jesus, but how do you deal with those kind of issues while you're trying to witness to them. It's um, kind of a hard road. I mean, like, I'm a little bit of a, more of an innocent naive to that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's not the first thing I can tell in a person that has troubles like that. And so um, it's a little fearful. How do you try to minister and witness to somebody who has a lifestyle so different. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have any wisdom on that. Well, not a lot, except uh, the, the best thing to do is, is to minister to the, the felt needs. I think of that quote from Ministry of Healing about how Jesus ministered to people. He, he met their physical needs. Um, and you know the quote. He won their confidence. And after the long line of, of things, and, and then he, he bade them to follow him. So when you're working with someone who's dealing with a, an addiction, um, I would you know, be there for support um, to you know, say, you know, I'm here. If, if there's any a time where you think I, I'm about to give in, I'm about to go buy some drugs or whatever, call me. Now, of course, make sure it's an appropriate relationship, ladies and ladies, men and men and so forth. But say, call me and, and then say, you know, and be available 24-7. Because it may be 2 o'clock in the morning when they're really struggling with that, that craving for the next hit. So um, help them with the physical needs. Uh, you don't have to be preachy at that point. You know, just say, I'm praying for you. Is there anything that I can do for you? And help them through the, the addiction. And then you build the confidence and then you work from there. And the continuing the discipling process. Yeah. While you're on that subject. We're, we're actually dealing with a family right now. And one of the things that we discussed, you know, is when would be an appropriate time to sit down with them and ask, can we pray with you? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I would, I would not give you a blanket answer to that. I would pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, and, and He will let you know. Yeah. And I would say, too, and, you, and I'm sure you know this, too, just, is when you're st- especially dealing with an addict, set boundaries for them that you're not going to cave on. And your boundary may be, you know, I'm not going to give them cash. Um, you know, I'm not going to let them borrow my vehicle. Um, because they're likely to drive while under the influence. You set boundaries and stick to it. Um, but say, you know, look, I'm here to, to help you and you know, be willing to buy groceries and that sort of thing. Good afternoon. Hi. Okay, now um, one thing that's puzzling to me personally where the Bible is concerned, is um, all this mention of wine. I've, I was just asking my wife as well, should I or shouldn't I ask the question, would I look dumb? However, to me personally, clarification is better. In the sense where as, um, as far as I can remember, one of the stories, Jesus turned water to wine at a wedding. Um, I've asked this question before. Someone told me, well, it wasn't really wine. It was grape juice. It wasn't fermented. You're not supposed to drink fermented drink. I can understand that. However, if it was grape juice, wouldn't it just be easier to say grape juice than wine? (laughs) Is there something that I'm missing? I'm not understanding or I'm smiling, but it's a serious question. Okay. Well, I can tell you the, the dread of every theology major is Greek and Hebrew. And every theology major asks when they arrive at our universities, is why do I have to learn Greek and Hebrew? And, and you just answered the question. In the scripture, obviously it wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek and Hebrew. And in the biblical language, there, is no, there are no two separate words for unfermented grape juice and fermented grape juice. It's all the same. Uh, the Greek word is oinos. So it's, uh, it's both. So you look at the context of, of what's being said to determine, uh, was it fermented, was it unfermented? Um, now, I'm not a systematic theologian, so I won't go into a lot more detail than that. But um, you look at the, the context, and in good wine, you know, they were talking about Jesus serving the, the best wine. Um, the best wine was unspoiled wine. Uh, it hadn't gone bad. It hadn't, um, hadn't fermented yet. Um, by the way, I, I have a sermon that I've preached that's, that's on where Jesus is wrestling in the garden. And he says, take this cup. And, um, the, and the sermon addresses what kind of cup he's talking about. And, and the short answer is the cup of God's wrath is sin. Um, but in that, that message, I talk about on the cross, Jesus is offered... Um, wine on two occasions. The first time he's offered it, he refuses it. The second time he's offered it and he accepts it. And a lot of people are confused by that. But the, the language that's used is that the first time he was offered an alcoholic beverage that had a, like a narcotic, it was a painkiller added to it. And he was offered that and he refused it. And, and my my guess, I haven't had a conversation with our Lord yet about this, but my guess is that he did not want his mental state altered while he was on the cross. He wanted his mind to be clear. But it's interesting, when it, uh, when it gets to the second time, it says that he was offered vinegar. Um, the difference between wine and vinegar is, is very interesting. What makes alcohol is you have bacteria eating up the sugar, and the byproduct of the bacteria eating the sugar, the waste, is alcohol. But what happens is the bacteria will eventually run out of sugar to to eat. And at that time, the bacteria um, begins to to break down, and the alcohol begins to break down, and it breaks down into an, the alcohol breaks down into an acid. And I'm trying to um, remember the name of the, Acetic acid, yeah. It, well, it breaks, so it breaks down into vinegar, but it's not alcohol. So when Jesus took the, when he drank the second time, it was not alcoholic. It was actually, it was vinegar. All the alcohol was, was gone. 
And I think it's very symbolic spiritually in that when there was still yeast in that, there were bacteria, you know, they use yeast and bacteria to make wine. While there was still yeast there, sin present, he didn't drink. But when the, the work had been done on the cross, he drank. When all of the sin had been removed from the beverage, the, the symbol of sin, the yeast, he drank. And I think it's symbolic. And when you look at the text, um, Jesus realized, or it says that when Jesus realized that it had been fulfilled, he said, I thirst. And they gave him the drink. So I think in that particular text is symbolic that he's a, a symbolism of the sin being removed completely because of his death on the cross. And then he drank. But anyway. Um, I'm not sure I have a question, but rather I'm trying to answer a little bit at Fernando's um, question about um, uh, addiction. I think a first step for any addiction of any type is um, be open. Uh, the alcoholic anonyms, I I'm not sure I say it correctly, but um, I think their principle was for openness. Be open. I mean, like, don't hide it under the carpet. The moment you're hiding it, you never, ha you never have any chance of succeeding on your own. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one thing that I'm always trying, to, when something like anything comes up regarding addiction or a sin or something, it's just be open about it, talk about it. Mm -hmm. If you're keeping it for yourself, then you'll be doomed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would just add that that applies to everything. You, you cannot be a Christian in isolation. You have to be part of a community. And to be part of a, a community, there has to be integrity. And there has to be openness with one another. So um, it, that is vital. Yeah. You mentioned before that um, the caffeine and the nicotine kind of work together. Could you mm -hmm. expand that a little bit? Because I've met people who absolutely condemn nicotine, but yet they drink coffee and they think it's okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I can hardly hear you. So you want to... Oh, can you, can you extend a little bit on that? Um, how nic nicotine and caffeine are alike or work right, together? Right, well, they're similar in their molecular structure. And so the, the body's response is very similar. Um, so that's all I meant. So that that one t does tend to lead to cravings for the other. Um, now, if you'd like for me to speak more on caffeine specifically, um, you may have seen, if you can go online and look, there are images where uh, they show spiders spinning spider webs, and they have um, introduced different chemical substances to the spiders. And then they show you pictures of the web. So you have a spider who's high on cocaine and shows you the web. And... Um, it's, um, if it wasn't sad that people are using those drugs, it would be, it would be comical. But what's interesting is the most, um, uh, what's the word to use? The web that is most disorganized, most um, different, the worst web, is the spider that's on, on caffeine. Um, but if you, if you Google that, you can... You can find you know, spiders on caffeine or things like that, and you'll, you'll, you'll see the, the images. Um, so, um, you know, Spirit of Prophecy is, is clear on, on caffeine. She has a lot to say about the dangers of it, and it's become, culturally, it's become the norm. Um, but it's, um, it is still a, a dangerous substance. One more thing, when, okay. I, when I talk to people who defend caffeine, they pulled up some, something from internet again about the positive things in caffeine. And they right. quote, oh, look, it has eight positive effects on you. Right. And I forgot what they were, but uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, when you look at anything, there's, you have to weigh the cost benefit. And if you, if you will remember, there was a study not too long ago that talked about how healthy red wine is and that if you drank a glass of red wine every day, it would reduce um, heart disease. Well, the conclusion was correct, but it was not the alcohol in the red wine. It was the, the actual grape juice. Yeah. So you can get the same benefit without the, without the alcohol. So what you would have to do is say, okay, knowing what we do about alcohol and its risk 
you know, even one glass of wine causes um, brain death, you know, brain cell death. So I don't know about you, but I can't afford to lose anymore. Um, so you, you look at, you know, a glass of wine impacts your frontal lobe of your brain. It impacts your ability to, to choose right from wrong. Um, so is that worth the health benefit for heart disease when I can, you know, abstain from the alcohol, drink, drink red grape juice and get the same benefit? It's the same sort of idea with, with caffeine. There may be some benefits for caffeine. Um, I'm not sure what those would be, but if you, if you stack up the negatives and they add the, the pros, um, it's still, it's, it's not beneficial. Um, a lot of people think too, you know, well, I got a long drive, it's gonna help me um, stay awake. But what they found, you know, doing studies where they test people, you know, in, in, simu in simulators where they're driving and they're on caffeine, they feel like they're this, you know, eyes are big, I feel awake, I feel alert. But the reaction time is still just as delayed, you know, they, they respond just as slowly as when without it, you know, just with fatigue. Um, so. We have a baptism we need to get to. Yes. So why don't you give us your benediction? Okay, I shall do that. Uh, this one is probably my favorite, and it fits into what we have been talking about, as well, especially in the last, last segment about bearing fruit and who it is that, that does that. It's, um, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. And so this is my prayer for, for you from, from Paul. So now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, According to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you.